Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sohan Suvarna. Uh, so this is the second session of the sizing procedure. So the first session. So a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Sohan Suvarna, as I mentioned. So currently I'm a research project engineer at uh, LTA Lab, uh, IIT Bombay. I work with Professor Pan. Uh, and uh, previously I was a PhD student. Uh, I did four years at IIT Bombay and uh, two years at Monash University. My work was on the uh, design and development of uh, autonomous uh, airships. So you could say I have about uh, six years of experience working on airships. Uh, and my research interests are uh, uh, LTA systems, uh, which include airships, aerostats, uh, things like that. And then design optimization of uh, these vehicles, uh, flight dynamics modeling, uh, I also do aerial robotics uh, and uh, trajectory planning for aerial robots. So uh, this is a little bit about me and uh, I guess we can go forward with the presentation. Uh, so a little bit of recap about what happened in the previous session. So I'm uh, presuming that basic concepts were covered, the aerostatics and the uh, critical length uh, of the airship, uh, sizing of the envelope and so forth. And also the design methodology, the procedure that we follow, the, flow, uh, the flowchart that if you recall, that was also covered in the previous session. Uh, so this is a continuation of that. Uh, so I would request you guys to uh, interject and ask me questions if you are not following anywhere uh, through this uh, presentation. So feel free to ask me questions. Uh, and I would certainly ask you questions uh, as we go forward. So let's start with uh, this uh, surface development. Uh, now, uh, you guys know what surface development is? Can anyone? No, sir. Uh, so it should have been a part of your uh, engineering curriculum. In your first year, you would have had engineering drawing. So if you, uh, if you can remember that you had to do something, say you have to make a 3D object, say a box out of uh, sheets. Uh, the, the the box that you get with the courier with Amazon or whatever that you get the carton that you get right it's basically made out of a 2D surface do you agree yes sir yeah yes. so so basically surface development is that so in your first year of engineering I am not sure because of the current situation whether you have had access to the uh, first year workshops but typically. You do, you do get to do sheet, uh, sheet metal modeling. Uh, you basically fold sheet metals, join them together to form uh, 3D objects out of 2D sheets, right? So that is surface development. So surface development is uh, mapping a 3D object from a 2D uh, surface. So you're basically uh, opening it up. So in the case of cube here, uh, you could maybe uh, fold it like this. So you basically have a 2D surface which would map like this for a 3D cube. Does this make sense? Uh, are you following me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So why am I talking about this? Can anyone tell me why I talked about this? How, how does it relate to an airship? To know the surface area? Uh, not really. Think about it. What, what, the, what is the main component in an airship? What's the biggest... Envelope, component? sir. Envelope. Yes. Exactly. So how do, how do I get that shape? Right, it's the it's the envelope. You're right. So I I have been I have been talking about surface uh, uh, development for that particular purpose. Now let me ask you a question. So how how do you think we would uh, make an airship envelope? Sir, can you repeat? Uh, how do we how do we make uh, how do we fabricate an airship envelope? 
Now, if you recall, airship envelope is a body of revolution, right? Uh, it's basically uh, some. Uh, so, how do I say this? Uh, uh, if you have a spherical ball, a football, for example, how 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 is a football made? How is a football fabricated? Any guesses? No? So stitched together. Yeah, they are stitched together, right? So we follow a similar approach for airships as well. Uh, so what we do is, we basically divide the whole envelope into a couple of uh, uh, forms or 2D shapes. So we call them petals, right? So that's why it's called petal profile uh, generation. Now the, now the question is, how do we generate these petals? And uh, how, how should the petals be? Just think about the uh, airship uh, images that you have seen in the past and try to relate. If you, if you notice some kind of pattern, the hint is actually in the picture. Sir, at the very front end, there are some lines. Yes. So those are the petals. If we connect those to the uh, till the end at the backwards. Yeah, that is correct. So that is exactly uh, how we are going to do that. So uh, now how do we generate these petals? Now, it's a curved surface, right? So we have to map it to a 2D surface, which is going to be a planar surface. Now, it is going to be tricky because if you look at the profile, it's not exactly, it's never exactly going to be an ellipsoid or a standard shape. So you would need some kind of a mapping technique to get that petal shape. Now think about how you could arrive there. Uh, I can give you a hint. Think of, uh, think of it like this. Uh, take a cross-sectional area. So the dotted lines is the area, uh, is the part, uh, is the place where you're uh, taking a cross-sectional area and you're looking at looking at it like from this direction from the front so what do, what do you what do you see there what would you see if you take that cross section a parabola uh, parabola why uh, any any circle, sir. A it circle, would be a circle. Circle. yes it would definitely be a circle because as I mentioned, it's a body of revolution, right? So what we have is one line, uh, this curved line on the top, and we just rotate it about the center of uh, uh, the, the axis of revolution, which is at the longitudinal uh, direction, and you just rotate it. So when you rotate it at any given point, if you, irrespective of where you move, where you take the cross section, you're always going to see a circle. Do you agree? Yes, sir. Okay. So from here, can you think of how we could generate petals? So we can divide the circles into various uh, equal cross sections. Uh, so uh, cross sections, maybe like sectors. Yes, sir. Right. So we. Uh, so in this case, I have made six sectors. So it would translate something like this, right? So uh, someone mentioned that from the start, from the nose to the tail, we just extend a line. So this would be something of this sort. Do, do, does this make sense? Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. Okay. All right. Now let's move on to the next part. Now, this is what we did. We basically, so in this case, we divided it to uh, six pieces. So the angle would be about 60 degrees, precisely 60 degrees. So this is how the petal would look like. Now, what do you think this width would be? Uh, the width of the petal. So you see that arrow mark, uh, uh, the dimension of the petal, right? So uh, this, this part, can you uh, make a guess as to uh, what would be the width of that? So length AB. AB, uh, which length? So there are two. One is the curved line and one is the chord. 
uh sir the cord the cord why would it be cord i'm not sure sir okay think about it so in the cross section so if you go back here so uh let me maybe annotate here a bit okay i can't find an annotation uh anyway so here uh, what what you see is uh, basically when you have to translate it here right the cord would just be the shortest distance but it wouldn't be what you want what you want is the arc length a to b because when when you when you are making when you are stitching together all the uh, petals you want the full shape of the circle right if you were to take the cord the circumference of the circle would be smaller right yes so so it's going to be this length ab so how do you find this arc length ab the width would be the arc length ab so the width width of the petal would be also equal to the arc length ab but the question is what is the arc length ab it's simple look at the answer is in the cross section what is the total uh, circumference of the circle 2 pi r 2 pi r so you know the radius right because you know what the profile is going to look like in the end right yes sir so now we know that the circumference is 2 pi r and we also know how many petals we are going to make so what do you think would the width be they are all equal come on uh, it's 2 pi r the whole circumference is 2 pi r and we have six petals here wouldn't it be 2 pi r over 6 yes sir arc length ab yeah it's precisely that actually so let's say you uh, decide uh, to have say six petals so in that case it would be 2 pi r over 6 so that's basically what the width would be uh, does this make sense are you following up till here yes sir okay all right now is that all we need for the petal uh, for for making a petal Uh, okay let me maybe uh ask you the question in a different way now let's so the length is also required yes exactly the length is also required so that's what i was going to come to so this we are only taking half of the envelope in this case right and this is how the petal would translate like now let's say at some point x you know you know the radius now my question is uh, you you also know the width now we just derived it in the previous slide now my question is would these two lengths be same l and x l is the length along the petal and x is the distance from the nose uh, to that particular point now would this l and x be same no why shape are different uh the shape is different yes so uh from the envelope how do you think we can get this l what what is l here in the envelope length from leading edge to the particular width uh, uh, how exactly uh, are you saying from the leading edge okay that is the nose of the airship uh, and from that that point to which point width first width uh, but that would only give you the chord length right from that point to the point uh, you you're saying basically where r is referred to right yes. so that wouldn't that just give you the chord length 
sir chord length will be from leading edge to trailing edge so no, chord length chord length is basically when you cut a circle and join any two points that's a chord so here if you say that it's from the leading edge to that point so it's just a straight line right yes sir yeah so that is not the case it's but you're close you're close to the answer so maybe uh, uh, we have to consider the arc there yes is... so, yeah that's precisely what it is so we this l is actually this arc length okay uh, does this make sense yes sir so we know the uh, ra- uh, we know the width of the petal that we derived from the local radius at any given point x we can know we know what the radius is from that we can determine for that particular x what is the petal width now we also know the length because uh, do we know the length l now now you correctly mentioned that it's the arc length of the envelope but what is that value how do you get that value Uh, sir, uh, with the formula two pi r uh, upon n p, because all the uh, all these are equal. No, two pi r over n p is for the width. So, see, l is varying across for every x. There is a, a definite l. Okay. So, along yes. this x, for you will you will be able to find this particular width of the petal. So, if you see the width of the petal, it starts from zero. It increases. Goes to the max and then reduces, right? Uh, are you yes, able? To yes, sir. Yeah. So, uh, my question is: This L, right? You are that is correct that it's the arc length of the envelope, but what exactly? How do you exactly find the value L? Okay, I will. Uh, i i will probably answer that uh, so let's look at a very small area let's look at this particular red circle and let's say this is how the curvature is okay now what we are going to do is we are going to uh, use pythagoras theorem so we know this x1 so some some random uh, small value of x1 we are going to assume we are going to take and then at that distance we know the radius uh, because we know the equation for the envelope is that is that fine up till this point are you okay with it yes so okay so what we are going to do is we are going to make an approximation saying that this l1 right so at this x1 this is going to be the length of the petal l okay so what we are going to do is we are going to make an assumption that it's a straight line so this approximation will get better and better when your x1 value is small uh do you agree yes sir yeah so it's going to coincide with the arc right so this is exactly what we are going to do for every single length throughout the entire length of the air shape we are going to take these uh, uh small triangles and then we are going to find l1 l2 so at say for at any given point l you want to find l so you would just uh, calculate the sum of all these small small segments so it's kind of like a loop when you when you're going to uh, if you're going to build an airship you're going to have to write a maybe an excel uh, sheet spreadsheet or something like that and you could just uh, code this uh, algorithm into it uh, any questions here up to uh, for for petal profile generation uh, is this part clear yes sir okay all right so let's move on so what we did here is we basically took the cross cross section of the envelope and with that we would be able to know what the width would be and uh, we also found out how the length correlates so with that you will be able to generate uh, petals now uh, depending on the number of petals that you want uh, you can cut that many number of petals so typically what we do is uh, we get on a on these posters the banners that you have we print a petal and then we cut it uh from the material that we are going to uh build it from so in this case on the right uh on the right bottom corner you see uh mpet uh, that is metallized polyethylene that material and on the left side what you see is a template 
So we use this as a template. We keep it on the sheet and then we cut the profile. So that's how we do it. On the top, you see uh, a PO coated uh, nylon. So these are some materials uh, that uh, are being used for making the envelope. Now, once you cut the petals, uh, you would also have to join them. Uh, any guesses as to how you would join these uh, petals? Any guesses? Okay. Uh, I hope uh, people are not sleeping. Uh, all right. No, no, sir. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, all sir, right. You're doing very well. Only okay. thing is, it's already 2.20. And remember, yeah. you have to stop at 2.50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm right on track, sir. Yeah. All right. So, uh, what we do typically is we have different ways of uh, joining this. And uh, we tip in our lab, we typically go for heat sealing method because it's convenient. Uh, so the types of joints, how do you join petals? So one is a bud joint. So that's basically uh, you put uh, two petals together and you can see the picture how it's joined uh, surface to surface. And then there is this uh, lab joint. So uh, bud joint is in the type one. So it's just overlapping over the uh, other sheet. So you have two petals. So you place one on top of the other and that becomes type uh, the bud joint. Lab joint would be uh, to have an additional sheet, a strip of the same material typically, and you put it on top of these two petals and then, then you seal it. The red line here represents the seal, okay? Uh, and then there is this cusp joint, uh, which is an easier version uh, because it's easy to seal uh, using a heat sealing machine, but it has its dis disadvantages as well. So you basically place it uh, together uh, and then like kind of pinch it and uh, heat it. So these are the three joints we typically follow. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, we don't uh, usually prefer cusp joint, even though it's simpler. Uh, lab joint is preferred uh, because uh, that way we get a better envelope shape and also it is better in terms of handling internal stress of the gas. Because you're going to fill it with uh, uh, hydrogen or helium, depending on the uh, what lifting gas you design it for. So that internal stress would be very well uh, handled using uh, 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 using a lab joint. And the other one is, uh, yeah, reducing uh, leakage. Leakage, I mean, uh, hydrogen or helium, it has a tendency to escape because the molecules are so small that they can escape through even very, very tiny uh, holes. So this we found to be a bit uh, reliable, a lab joint. So that's why we usually prefer lab joints. Uh, so this is a fabrication uh, process. Uh, so sorry, I oh, sorry. This is uh, pardon me for the title. It's a lab joint uh, that we are going to uh, show here. So when we have to do a lab joint, uh, what we have is a hull profile uh, which is cut on a HDP foam, high density polyethylene foam. So we keep the material on top of it, and then we uh, paste the uh, edges together. Pasting is basically, in this case, we are using heat sealing. And uh, as you can see, uh, the person who is doing it is using the ironing uh, box. So he's just pressing over uh, with a certain heat on top of that uh, uh, strip. So the silver colored thing, what you see is a strip and he's joining two petals together. Okay. Uh, so this is a lap joint. Uh, yeah. So basically, uh, when, when you're doing this, we also need to give a provision for uh, nozzle for filling in the gas. And uh, end discs, I will show you in a while what, what, what we mean by end discs. So they're basically to get a better shape for the airship and also to avoid leakages. Uh, now I'll share a short video about this uh, in a while. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, there are different ways of sealing it. So the one method that we use is RF sealing, uh, radio frequency sealing. The way that uh, this works is uh, you have a dielectric material, which is the envelope. Uh, so what, what this uh, radio frequency does is you oscillate the material at such a high frequency that the 
material fuses together. Now, this is applicable to only certain elements which have this uh, polar molecular structure. It's not applicable. RF sealing cannot be done on all materials. It needs to have that uh, polar molecule structure uh, in the for, for it to fuse. So that's how that's when RF sealing would work. The other approach is heat sealing. Uh, so you can use a simple uh, iron box to seal two envelopes, or uh, you could use something like uh, this. So this is a heat sealing machine. And uh, to be very frank, this machine is not meant for airships. This machine is actually meant for making uh, food packets. So when you go to the grocery, uh, there are these sealing machines, right? They, they just put in the raw material, whatever you want to buy, rice or whatever, and then they seal it. This is that machine. Uh, even the lace packet that you get uh, air filled with very little chips inside, that's basically made from this material and a similar machine. Up till here, uh, do you have any questions? No, sir. Okay. All right, so maybe I'll just show a short video about uh, how this is uh, applicated. So the, as I mentioned, the first thing is petal cutting. So see that white thing that you see is the template and the silver colored thing is the uh, MPET material, metallized polyethylene tetra, uh, tetra So that material uh, is being cut first. So it's cut according to the template. And then we uh, have, uh, so depending on how many petals were accounted for, then you seal it using the heat sealing machine. Now in this case, this is a foot press, uh, but this person is also uh, exerting external pressure. Uh, that's because to ensure that the seal is uh, the seal is done properly. So we don't want leakages. So that's the reason why this person is uh, holding it uh, with his hands. Uh, so this is the this is an important thing that we do. Uh, so we have this uh, helium leak, dete leak detector. So we basically uh, move it around the envelope, uh, especially around the seals, to see if there are any uh, leaks. Now uh, it might seem uh, a little bit uh, trivial, but it's actually kind of important because uh, compared to air. Helium or hydrogen, they have a higher tendency of uh, escaping the envelope because they are light. Okay, so that's why we do ensure that there are no leaks before we deploy the airship. So this is the example of a finished airship. So here they have used uh, lap joints. Now, if you see in the front portion, there is this uh, circular thing there. Now that is what uh, we meant when we said end disk wherever leakage. So that is the end disk. So we have it at the uh, front and at the back. So that also ensures that you get a better shape uh, at the nose and also to avoid leakages. Uh, any questions? How air pressure should be maintained? Uh, uh, so the correct term is lifting gas pressure because air pressure is outside. We have lifting gas inside. So it's uh, in this case, we are not maintaining it. So we ensure that there is no leak. Once you ensure that there is no leak, uh, then you fill it with the lifting gas. Because there is no leak, it should it would uh, the envelope would retain that gas pressure. So in this case, the uh, envelope is not uh, fully inflated because you are still able to see wrinkles, right? When the airship is fully inflated, these wrinkles would disappear. So it's kind of like a visual uh, based experience based thing that we uh, look at and then we. Uh, realize it's similar to uh, what you do with latex balloon so the party balloons that you have when you blow air into it when it is small it's kind of wrinkly and it's you can you know uh, poke it and it would still feel that it's not uh, hard enough but when when you fill it with air it's it takes a certain shape and it, it, you could feel that there is pressure inside uh, have i answered your question yes sir okay all right uh, uh, I am not sure about this envelope though, because there is this silver colored patch. I am guessing this is, uh, they identified a leak there and they probably patched it up. So, uh, Sohan, that, Sohan, that is basically a valve to fill the gas inside. Oh, okay. Okay. So the back pressure valve. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. All right. So, uh, yeah, that, that was my second uh, guess. 
Okay, so uh, basically what they do is they have this tube also made out of the same material and then you just attach it to the uh, envelope. So uh, that's that's what it is. Okay, now come before I go to the gondola part, uh, is there any question on petal profile generation or uh, how an airship envelope is fabricated? Okay, all right. So in that case, I'll uh, go to gondola. So gondola is uh, fairly simple. Uh, so we basically pick some material which is of uh, uh, which has a lower mass and something like corrugated plastic sheet or uh, bamboo or balsa wood, uh, things like that. So we, we prefer it to have some kind of strength because it's also going to house your payload and uh, most often uh, the uh, propulsion units as well. So we would go with the uh, SDP sheets or uh, some uh, styrofoam sheets, corrugated plastic sheets or uh, carbon fiber rods as well. Uh, some materials are mentioned here. And uh, yeah, so these are the recommended materials. HDPE is uh, high density polyethylene. So the reason why these two things are uh, uh, recommended, corrugated sheet and HDPE, Corrugated sheets are easy to fold and uh, fabricate. So in the first picture you see, that's a corrugated sheet. So they have basically folded it and just glued it together. So it's easy to make that frame. And STP, uh, you could uh, just like you would make a air, uh, airplane wing. It's easy to uh, fabricate, machine it using hot wire. So that's why these are the two recommended materials. Uh, and uh, the design can be up to your requirement. So in this case, uh, it was uh, made to have uh, ac uh, accommodate avionics and payload. Uh, motors on the gondola. So this is very important because this is what is going to propel your uh, airship. So here uh, on the left side, you see a BLDC motor, a brushless DC motor uh, being uh, attached to the uh, gondola. And in the on the right side, what you see is uh, how how it relates to the envelope. So it's on the bottom, and the thrust motor is facing backwards, so so that the thrust would be forward. Okay. Uh, yeah. So in this case, uh, what, there were two different thrust motors. So one for lift, one for uh, uh, vertical motion lift, and the other one for thrust. Now I have a question: uh, If airship is uh, buoyant it derives its lift from buoyancy. Why do you need a lift motor there? So can you repeat? Sorry? So not clear with the question. So the question is, see, uh, in the first bullet point, I uh, it's mentioned that there are two brushless DC motors, one for lift and one for thrust. So the thrust one is pretty straightforward, I'm guessing, because it's just to provide the airship with forward motion, right? My question is, why do you need a lift motor? Why do you need a dedicated motor for lift? Because airship is a buoyant vehicle, right? So you, you're basically generating lift using buoyancy. Uh, are you following my question? Yes, sir. Yeah, so why do we need a lift motor in this case? Uh, sir, uh, because uh, buoyancy will be static, sir. Uh, what do you mean static? Like, uh, it will just go upwards and uh, like... Uh, yeah, yeah you're, you're right, you're right. Uh, go ahead. Sir, to generate the dynamic lift, uh, we need a PLDC motor. Uh, that like, is true. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sir, uh, buoyancy will just uh, take us uh, up, uh, give us the up thrust. So yes. basically, we will need something to control that uh, thrust. That is correct. So what we typically do is uh, we uh, we would basically uh, uh, we, we would basically design the airship such that it there is some static heaviness. Now, what static heaviness is? I think it's mentioned. It was mentioned in the previous uh, session. So static heaviness is basically. Uh, some kind of uh, extra weight that you put, which is a little bit more than uh, buoyancy. Okay, so that way we have a better control over the airship. So let's say your motors fail. Okay, all your motors on your airship fails. 
the airship, if it is statically heavy, it's going to descend to the ground very slowly. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. So, so basically, this thrust motor is only giving a very tiny fraction of the lift just to keep the airship afloat in the air. Okay, that's the reason why we have we why we also need some kind of thrust input for lift. Uh, so yeah, so this was basically attached. The gondola was attached using uh, ribbons and velcro. Uh, the red red thing that you see is a ribbon, and under it uh, there were velcro velcro strips. So we used industrial grade velcro strips to stick this because we want it to be firmly attached to the gond uh, to the envelope. The gondola should be firmly attached. That's the reason. Okay, all right. Uh, and then yeah, so we also had. Okay, this is an important point. Now, uh, it would take a long time for me to explain this, but let me explain it to you in a very simple way. Now, when you're sitting on a, uh, you, you know what seesaw is, right? A seesaw in the playground, yeah. So, that basically works by balancing the center of gravity. Do you agree? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes. so in the case of airship, that pivot point, the center point of the seesaw is, is at the center of volume. Okay. Now, if the CG of the airship is a little bit misaligned, say forward or backward, your airship is going to either nose, uh, nose uh, it's going to be nose heavy or tail heavy, like a seesaw. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, sir. So what we do is after this is, uh, uh, after the envelope and the gondola is done, we try to adjust the CG by placing a gondola in a place that it's balanced. It's like in equilibrium. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't become nose heavy or tail heavy. Okay. So that's what uh, this means. The last point. Uh, is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So the next part is the pin and the stabilizer sizing. Uh, so let me ask you one question. Why do we need fins on any aircraft? Not just on airships. Sir, for stabilize uh, for stabilization purpose and for controlling the aircraft. Uh, how do you mean stabilize? Like, what exactly does the pin do? Uh, sir, uh, the control surfaces uh, of the fin moves uh, through which we will get the uh, we will get the the required motion. Uh, that is not true. So, what if there is no control surface and you only have a fin? That's the case with most airships, most small airships. Okay, so the reason why we have fins is to have some kind of, uh, you're right, it's for, stabil uh, it's for stability. Uh, so there are two kinds of stability. So very simply put, uh, think of a weather vane, right? Do you know what a weather vane is? Uh, no, sir. Weather vane is basically like, uh, you, uh, it basically tells you what direction the wind is and uh, how much the wind is. So what it has is uh, a very a big tail. So it kind of uh, aligns that a particular arrow, for example, it's like an arrow, which would align itself in the direction of the wind. Okay. So in very simple words, it's that. Uh, I am not sure if I could annotate here. I don't see that option. Uh, yeah, but it's basically uh, that. So when, when you're, uh, so you want the uh, airship or the aircraft to face the direction of the wind because that's where you have the maximum thrust. All your, even in jet aircrafts, you have the jet facing along the longitudinal axis. So that's why you want some kind of stability and that's what this fin would do. Uh, is that clear? Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. So let's just look at these two airships. Uh, I just want you to have a uh, look at the fins of these two airships. Uh, and I'm, come, I'm going to uh, ask some questions on this later on. So just, just uh, try to grab the image in your mind. Okay. So the methodology that we follow, this is a very simple methodology, which is based on uh, historical uh, data of several RC airships. So what, what, what was done is like we considered a lot of several RC airships. 
we parameterized uh, the parameters that would be required for sizing the fin. For example, the the base cord and the top cord, uh, the span of the fin, aspect ratio, and those such such things, the location of the uh, fin. So those things are parameterized, and then we kind of have this standardized values. So this is kind of like a good uh, good place to start your design. But if you want, you can. There is also a more rigorous way of uh, designing fins. So this is pretty straightforward, I believe. You just have these ratios. So depending on because you know what the uh, surface area of the airship is going to be, uh, the volume of the airship, the length of the airship, all those things would be available to you at this point. So you just plug in these values, and with these formula, you would be able to arrive at these relations. Uh, is that clear? So why aspect ratio is multiplied by four? That's a good question. Uh, so that four is because we have four fins. So uh, that's the reason why there is that four. Okay, uh, and that's also how it was. Uh, because if you see, these are empirical relations, meaning uh, there is no, uh, uh, it, it's mostly like curve fitting, fitting a curve. So it depends on how you have defined your variables. Now that four was considered because there are four fins on an airship and the other things were uh, parameterized with respect to that particular value. Okay. Okay, sir. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Have I answered your question, by the way? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, if there are no questions, I can move ahead. Now, as I mentioned, uh, so there are different ways you can put uh, put the fins on the airship envelope. So one is uh, the plus configuration. That's a typical one that I showed you in the pictures. Uh, typically, we have this bottom fin with the yaw motor. If you look at this here, so both these airships have a bottom fin with the yaw motor, right? You see that circle cut out. Yes, sir. Yeah, so that's basically the yaw motor. And then you have uh, side and the top. They are uh, mostly identical in nature. Not much difference. Uh, and the lower one, we lower fin, we make it heavy for static stability. Now, this is because, uh, as I mentioned, like in the seesaw case, we have the center of volume on top, on the top, and we want the center of gravity to be at the bottom. So that's why we try to put as many heavy things as possible at the bottom of the airship because that would ensure that it's kind of like a suspended pendulum and it's stable. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Now, the question that I wanted to ask you is why do we have these slits in the tail motor? So either these slits or uh, holes uh, as you consider uh, in the case of this. Any guesses? Uh, sir, uh, they are the motors installed, right? Yes. Uh, so, uh, so they will take the intake and uh, uh, they will give the output in other directions. So uh, basically we will be using them, uh, the directions for the control, directions yeah, of the motor. That's correct. So that's exactly why we have that. So it's basically like uh, when we have a, when we put a rotor there, we want the air to pass through the holes. So that's the reason why we have the slits or the hole in the previous picture. Now, another question I want to ask you is in most of the airship that we showed here, we typically have a yaw motor. We don't have a control surface. Can you guess why? Uh, sir, uh, maybe because uh, we are operating at very low speeds. That's correct. So at low, low speed, uh, so uh, at low speed, what happens is uh, we have a lower dynamic pressure. So because of that, the impact of the control surface, elevator, rudder, or any other thing, that would be very, very less. So at low speeds, it's better to have a yaw motor. So that's the reason why if you look at bigger airships, the one which flies outdoor, they typically have this uh, rudder, rudder and other control surfaces. Okay? Okay, moving on. Uh, mass breakdown. Now, this is a fairly simple uh, thing. So this, again, is also based on history. So avionics basically means uh, all the components, uh, electronics that you're going to put on board, uh, propulsion motors and all those things. So you basically estimate the weight for that. So there is a, uh, it's kind of curve fit and it's a reasonable uh, a, a approximation that you can do uh, for every motor, how, uh, what is the weight that you're going to have. 
So it's kind of fit into this curve. You see there is a linear relation. The same thing with the batteries as well. So uh, depending on what thrust you require. Now, how do you determine what thrust is required for an airship? Any guess? Hello? Okay, all right, uh, maybe I'll just answer. Uh, so the thrust is dependent on the aerodynamic drag. So depending on what velocity you want to move the airship, the thrust would be determined like that. Okay, so you basically determine what would be the drag and depending on that, you know what the thrust is going to be. Now, once you know the thrust, you can identify the motors, you can know what the weight is. And once uh, the thrust is also known, you can also identify what, what kind of uh, cells you're gonna put in the airship. So basically these two graphs will help you do that. And the next one is the motor parameters. So you also need to plan for endurance. How long is your airship going to fly? Now that is a function of how much battery capacity you have and also how much current the motor is going to draw, okay? So this, you see there is a, a kind of, uh, I would say parabolic relation between thrust and current. So you see uh, uh, using this particular uh, fitted curve, you can estimate what current for that particular thrust would be. And with that current, uh, with that particular uh, thing, you can also, uh, estimate what the propeller diameter is going to be and further uh, the uh, battery uh, mass can also be estimated. So depending on what capacity, what endurance you require, so that battery capacity is typically mentioned in milliampere hour, you can estimate the mass of the battery as well. Uh, so these are for two different uh, kinds of batteries. So the first one is two cell battery and the second, uh, second one is three cell battery. Any questions up till this point? Sir, you said that uh, thrust uh, thrust we can find with the help of drag. Yes. But uh, in that case, uh, th thrust uh, will be equal to drag in only steady level flight. That is correct. So then uh, about dynamic conditions. Okay. So when we when we have to estimate thrust, right? What we we don't consider the steady level uh, the uh, the cruise cruise speed. So cruise speed is the one for which the airship is being fabricated. And then there is this maximum speed that you have. So we will consider the maximum speed. And on top of that, we also have some kind of uh, load factor. So we basically multiply with a certain number, some kind of, uh, it's like factor of safety. So that would also enable you to have a little higher capacity. It will help you fight the wind if if there is any wind on the airship, that's how it's going to counter the wind as well with that additional power. Uh, okay, uh, have I answered your question? So not clear. Okay, so what I'm trying to tell you is, uh, you have the, you have an airship, right? So let's yes. say it's uh, it's designed to operate at one meters per second. Okay, that's the optimal optimum uh, velocity that I want the airship to operate at but I'm not going to consider one meter per second. It will also have a maximum speed, say it's two meters per second. So I'm going to find drag for two meters per second. Okay. Yes, sir. Now we have a higher value for the thrust and we are also going to account for some uh, disturbances or maneuvering the requirements of the thrust. So that will come in form of a, a, a thrust to weight ratio. So that's kind of a number that you multiply to the weight of the airship and then you uh, kind of it's, it's like a factor of safety i would say so you just add it to the drag that you get multiply so let's say you get about uh, 10 newtons of uh, drag for maximum speed okay and i i want the factor of safety to be two so i would actually go for a motor which is capable of providing 20 newtons not 10 newtons does that make sense now yes sir. got it so we are basically considering the upper limit. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, so to summarize everything that we have discussed so far. So the input to the system is payload, velocity, operating altitude, and the endurance. Now payload is going to determine the size of the airship, right? Because 
uh, if you recall, uh, there was something called as critical length and there was this uh, graph, right? Which kind of showed uh, how much the payload increases after uh, certain, uh, after the critical length. So that is basically going to, the payload is basically going to determine the size of your uh, uh, airship. Then you have velocity, which is going to di uh, dictate the requirement of your thrust, the propulsion system. So, and then you have the operating altitude. Now, why do we need operating altitude? Any guesses? Sir, uh, due to uh, pressure, uh, pressure uh, variation in the atmosphere uh, with uh, height. Yes. Uh, so, why do we need it? Sir, like uh, pressure constantly uh, goes on changing with respect to height. So, we will need a, a specific altitude for safety of the passengers. Uh, that's somewhat right, but the answer is more detailed. But to uh, to tell you a very a very brief explanation, uh, so one thing, of course, it's the pressure. The second thing is also the density changes. Density of the gas also changes. So that also needs to be accounted for while you're designing. But since you're designing, since this process is for indoor airships, uh, the at lower altitudes, the density and the pressure uh, deviation is not very significant. Okay, so you you may if you're designing a smaller airship, you can you can uh, assume that it's at a certain altitude and take those values and go ahead with the design. And endurance, the last point, uh, endurance is required for battery computation. So because you need to know how long you're going to fly the airship, and that is going to determine what is the capacity of the battery that you require, and also that particular capacity of battery is also going to add to your uh, mass of the airship. Okay. So that also will determine to some extent the uh, uh, the size of the uh, airship, both velocity and the endurance. Okay, uh, so that th these are the inputs and the output, as I mentioned, uh, so envelope size that you can determine now. Petal layout we discussed in the beginning of the presentation uh, in of this session, and then the uh, required avionics uh, spe specifications which we basically uh, use historical data, empirical data to uh, arrive at. Okay, so this is a summary of it. And uh, there is another last thing that I want to discuss. Uh, sorry, I shot a little over time, but this is a very short topic. So ground handling. So for indoor airships, we typically have this mast. Uh, so there's a reason why we have it. One is to just keep it steady. So this is just something that was made in our lab. So on the left, you have CAD module. On the right, you have the actual model. Uh, so this is how it uh, looks like. Now you see there is this uh, kind of conical thing at the front. That's, the, that's called a nose pattern. And that is used to attach the airship to the, uh, uh, to the mast. Now the reason why we require a mast <coughs> If one, uh, you want to store the airship somewhere. And the other one is that when you have a sufficiently big airship, there, is, there are going to be stresses uh, involved in the envelope. So this mast would uh, be such that it's free, it can freely rotate about its uh, axis. It can yaw freely. And uh, that way, whatever wind or disturbances are around, it will not affect the envelope of the, it will not uh, rupture the envelope of the airship. So that's the reason why we have the mast. As I mentioned, uh, we have nose patterns. So one reason why we have is structural strength. And the other one is to connect to the mooring mast. Now, why, why do I say structural strength? Uh, so for that, I will show you one short video. So this was, uh, this was a flight of, I think, a pad airship. Now look at the airship while it flies. So right now it's a little slow and uh, I think as the time passes on, there was some leakage in that. So yeah, this is the point that I want uh, wanted you to note. Can you see that? The nose is actually including, nose of the airship. Now, this is my last question. So why do you think this is happening? Any guesses? Uh, so like, uh, was there a leakage 
or uh, due to drag uh, it just went inside uh, actually i think the reason is both in this case uh, there was a yes, little uh, lesser pressure inside the envelope and also the uh, so what happens is uh, yes it is drag so so the idea is that the dynamic pressure right dynamic pressure uh, is basically by virtue of the speed of the uh, airship so that dynamic pressure the internal pressure of the envelope should be higher than the dynamic pressure so if that is not the case what would happen is the drag would be higher the drag force would create so much pressure on the front of the airship the nose of the airship that it's going to implode and that's exactly what happened here so that's also the reason why we require uh, nose battens okay uh, so so that we can enable the airship to fly at higher speeds and uh, uh, tar uh, target higher dynamic pressure so that's about uh, it and uh, if you have any questions you can ask me and sorry i shot 5 minutes over time uh, sir i had uh, a question regarding those uh, motors used in fins like uh, what type of motors they are used that oh they are uh, so okay so let me talk about these this one so on the top is the black beauty airship in that case they used the bldc motor and on the bottom is the eureka one airship in that we use the coreless dc motor so it depends on the size uh, the first one the black one was meant for uh, semi indoor operations so it was kind of like an enclosed area which was half covered and half open so here we required a little bit higher forces so that's the reason why bldc motors were used more thrust whereas the second one was entirely indoors that's why we used the smaller thrust uh, motors which which require which, which would give you only uh, sufficient thrust to uh, maneuver in an indoor environment so in the second case it was uh, coreless dc motor yes sir okay any other questions sir is there any loads are present inside the envelope sorry any loads any load uh, yes there would be hoof stress inside the envelope that's by uh, because of the pressure the gas pressure apart from that we typically in these two envelopes or uh, the other envelopes we don't usually put anything inside the envelope we just keep it exclusively for uh, lifting gas uh, okay sir. but that is not the case for uh, bigger airship outdoor airships they also have a certain other mechanism which basically would regulate the pressure but that is a uh, Uh, that i think you could uh, watch that on the npl lectures because uh, that all th discusses about the balloonet system yes so yeah so in this case there was nothing inside it was just a uh, lifting gas okay so